Thank you, Andrew. And what an honor to be here with all of you. So many brilliant, thoughtful, dedicated, and committed, committed people working to serve the world and to change the very issues that we're talking about today. So it's a mad, mad, mad cyber world we live in today. What does that mean? And where do we want to go with it? So first, let's start with the stark reality. And I'm going to mention three points. Number one, anything attached to a network can be hacked. Point number two, everything is being attached to networks. So there follows point number three, everything is vulnerable. So that's the baseline. That's the world we live in, and that's a reality we can't forget. I, I modestly call those three Beckstrom's Law of Cybersecurity. It uh, helps me remember them. Um, that's the reality. So how did I get involved with this? Because actually I spent three and a half years after 9-11 as a peace activist working for peace, to build, building networks of CEOs around the world working on track two diplomacy. From that work we learned a lot about how to nurture, cajole, shepherd, develop decentralized networks, and also by studying uh, Al-Qaeda. And through that work, Ori Bronfman and I then together authored The Starf Starfish and the Spider, The Unstoppable Power of Leaderless Organizations. Great surprise to us, fast uptake in many different circles, including government and military, activism communities, political communities. The book is now in, in 17 languages. And I then got asked to serve as the founding director of the US National Cybersecurity Center. Because of the applicability of those theories, the network theory to terror networks and to the internet itself, which of course, as we know, is what? The world's greatest decentralized network ever. It's just, it's truly remarkable. So that's how I got involved in this path. So what is this mad, mad, mad world? And that's what I'm here today to talk about, is this world that we're in and to propose a model for, for your consideration and to think about to bring some clarity to this inordinately in-dimensional and complex problem. The first MAD came to us in about 1945, nuclear MAD, the classic definition that we think about. Nuclear MAD reshaped the global geopolitical scene, led us to create the World Bank, the IMF, all these institutions to try to avoid mutual annihilation through mutually assured destruction. So MAD was with us, reshaped global politics, helped us keep the precarious peace that we enjoy until today, and it's still with us. Still with us, did I lose the, uh, the, the, the mic? So that's one man. What's the second man? It's cyber man. Cybersecurity, mutually assured disruption, and it is on the rise. It's a power held by nation states, and it's a power that many would argue is held by powerful hacking groups today, and in some cases, maybe even lone wolves. And as I think it was discussed in a previous breakout session on government and cybersecurity, when Camille and Alex or others were talking about uh, how the current path on the internet is cyber weaponry and more cyber war. And when will we get to peace? And how are we going to get there? And that's going to take a lot of work from all of us. But right now, we're not on the path to that stability in the system because we see cyber mad, mutually assured disruption, increasing. Third mad is internet mad. And that's the madness we all have for the internet, or more specifically, internet mutually assured dependence. We're all more dependent on this every day for communicating with one another, for organizing, for working, for building, for our zip cars, for the ways we connect where mutually assured dependence is growing. And that holds us together. And that helps to balance off the other two MADs. Because the nuclear MAD had a finite number of nation states interacting, setting up a global regime. CyberMAD changes that, and the other MAD holds us together. So let's look at a couple of case, case studies right, that are in the news today. So the first will be Stuxnet. I assume most people are familiar with Stuxnet. How many people are familiar with Stuxnet? I know where I'm right. You're a super tech-savvy crowd. So it's malware, or some might call it weaponware, uh, that was developed to interrupt uh, nuclear enrichment uh, in Iranian centrifuges that the Iranians discovered in about 2010 on their systems. And uh, this, uh, this malware did lead about 1,000 out of 9,000 centrifuges to fail uh, and caused a disruption uh, for a period of time in those Iranian operations. Now, what then happened? 
Well, Iran noticed this happened, right? First thing is uh, some hackers got a hold of the code and reverse engineered it and shared it on the internet, so that's now available to others, and that's part of the new cycle that we're in with CyberMad. Uh, the other thing that happened is that Iran responded. And how did they respond? Well, we don't need to go far from this building to talk to the banks in New York City uh, and other banks around the Western world to get their take on how these, what these DDoS attacks have been like. Heavy, heavy DDoS attacks. Increasing, changing over time. So that was one reaction. Then last August, August 15, people remember what happened? Less awareness on these shores than others, but on August 15, 20,000 people were sitting at their desks in Saudi Aramco working, and all their machines went black simultaneously. 20,000 machines. Okay? And initially, fingers pointed to Iran, and uh, 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 since then, fingers are starting to point in other directions and talk about possibly uh, uh, hacking circles and groups having done it. Uh, but Iran may have been involved. It's certainly cyber mad. And certainly, in the last few weeks, we've noticed the discussions in Capitol Hill about what? but the allegation that uh, Iranian cyber forces have been uh, visiting the oil and gas industry in the United States and moving through uh, their computer systems and industrial controllers and therefore possibly presenting a significant uh, threat in the future to uh, the systems in this country. So that's cyber mad and, and that's stepping through it. So the Stuxnet case went from nuclear mad because it was, it was created to prevent nuclear proliferation. It adds to cyber mad which is mutually assured disruption. And I'd argue that the only breaking factor is probably the fact that, that the countries are all dependent upon the internet for our operations. So no one really wants to see the whole net go down. Uh, so that's that context. Or take it to US China, right? And tomorrow there'll be conversations between President Obama and the President of China about cybersecurity and what's going on. So what's the situation mad, mad, mad with US and China? It's First is very stable on the nuclear side. Mutual assured destruction, both very respectful parties working through all the international agencies, trying to stop proliferation, including in places like Korea, where both countries are working together. What's the CyberMad situation? Is there disruption? No, there's not really disruption. There's not industrial attacks at this point in time, and let's hope there's not. There's a lot of information exchange going on, okay? and heavy information exchange going on, and all kinds of allegations about stolen IP, but it has not led to a level of kinetic activity. And then finally, you look at mutual assured dependence, the two countries also are extremely mutually interdependent on the internet with the supply chains, communications, or economies, financings. So the, the, the mad structure between US and China is very stable, and that's why it's gonna be difficult and challenging to uh, deal with the IP issues. Uh, the intellectual property issues with the allegations of huge amounts of IP uh, uh, moving uh, in one direction in the corporate uh, sector. Uh, so this MAD model, we can use it and look at different situations and we can think about where do we want to go with this. So I think where we go is ultimately our creation, right? The internet's our creation and where we take it's a collaborative effort. But in the spirit of collaboration, I'd like to put out four ideas today for consideration. And the first is that I think we've got to do more work on the diplomatic front. In the same way, when nuclear mad came, we're kind of where we were in the 1950s with nuclear mad, which is we know there's a really big problem brewing. We're not really sure how to deal with it. There's a lot of failed attempts um, that we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, but we've got to develop the norms, the standards, the definitions in an international realm that fits the new mad, mad, mad world, which is different than the one that we've been in. Number one. Number two, we have to try to build some trust amongst parties uh, in this environment, which is not always going to be easy because countries, peoples, citizens, private sectors have very different views. But without trust, you can't stabilize a system. You can't get to security. You can't get to a peaceful outcome that you want to have. So how do you get to trust when there's so much distrust? And the, the answer is, of course, finding common ground. We've got to find the common ground where even parties that may be adversaries in some parts of the cyber wars and cyber discussion find common ground to work on. What might that be? Human trafficking, for example. Most countries and most of the superpowers of the world don't want to see human tra trafficking happening. They don't want to see terrorism happening. There's a set of activities that are shared in common 
that can bring the countries together. And we have to focus on that to start building confidence and building the seeds of trust to evolve the, the system, including diplomatic solutions. Third thing, and this is where this group certainly contributes a lot, is transparency. Transparency and getting the incentive structures right. So the internet, you know, brings this incredible amount of data together for all of us, but what we've missed so far in the cyber dialogue and the legislation around the internet is how can we empower groups to legitimately get transparency out of other parties they need to. There's, there's some that's allowed, there's some that's not allowed that goes on. But I'd argue that when you look at penetration testing, okay, you look at the concerns a lot of groups have about how open and, and uh, systems are to attack, you've got to use penetration testing. It's one of the best methods to actually find out the state of a network and whether it's secure. And don't in some ways citizens and individuals have a right to know how well their data is being handled and protected? Don't companies, nonprofits, your organizations have a right to know how it's being held and protected? So how can we craft policy structures to create the rights for penetration testing amongst different parties that are sharing data, to, which can greatly increase the security of the system and also make sure that, that our information is, is being protected? I think there's a lot of work we need to do around that and creating the economic incentives that go along with that. And then finally, the internet itself, you know, the reason we have this problem is, and, and Vint Cerf has shared this with me, as has Bob Kahn and others, is the internet was designed for openness and data sharing. It wasn't designed for security. So it's doing what it was designed for. But we can redesign it to be more secure. And the global technical community is the key to that. And so whether it's putting a lot more resources into implementing things like PGP, pretty good privacy, DNSSEC, uh, which, which adds security to the whole global uh, domain name system, uh, or new technologies under development like DANE, our DNS-based authentication of named entities. And I don't want to geek out here and go into details, but there's a few key protocols and standards being developed within the, I, the IETF and other groups that we need to get behind and get layered into the system effectively uh, so that we tighten up the system. So this is the world we now live in. It's the one we created. It's the one we share, and uh, um, I think that all of your efforts are just incredibly important, and I look forward to working together with you on how we bring a little bit of sanity to the mad, mad, mad cyber world we live in. Thank you.